Hey guys, how are you doing? This is Zeb from Zed Outdoors and I hope you're having an awesome day. So today I am back with my buddy, Craig Fordham. Craig, how are you doing? I'm very well, my friend. Well, if you haven't done so already, we've done a part one of this two-part series. And in part one with Craig, we covered in detail the whole topic of bow drill in terms of friction, fire lighting. Now in this part two, what we're looking at is the topic of hand drill, okay? So if you haven't done so already, I'll put a link below to that bow drill video. You can go and check that out in your own time. And in that we covered a lot, a lot of aspects of the whole system of bow drill from A to Z and being able to achieve fire lighting basically using the bow drill method. Now in this video, what we're gonna be looking at is hand drill. Now hand drill is something I've been aware of for a very long time, I've never done. I've never done hand drill, and I don't really know a huge amount about it. A little sporadic bits of information here and there. So you guys watching this video are gonna have the same experience as I'm having learning kind of for the first time the entire process. Now, if you haven't watched the uh, first video, I cover kind of Craig's background there with quite a bit, but Craig is a very, very experienced outdoorsman and bushcraft instructor. He runs a full-time school here in the southeast of England in the county of Kent in Ashford. This is a beautiful woodland, very diverse, and Craig teaches uh, on a full-time basis. Now, one of his specialities is friction fire lighting. He demonstrates throughout the country, and he has literally taught hundreds of people uh, bow draw and hand draw respectively. So in this video, what we're gonna be doing is spending time with Craig and going through the whole gamut of hand drill. What we're gonna do first is assuming you don't even know what a hand drill is for some of you, we're gonna have just a brief overview of what it is so you have an idea of what this video is about. What we're then gonna do is make the components that go into the hand drill and we're then gonna finish off by looking at the actual technique and eventually ending up with an ember that we could then go ahead and light a fire with. So obviously in a bow drill, we covered a lot of things, okay? Mm. Um, now with the hand drill, there are obviously some different nuances, okay? Very and, much. Things, and things to kind of bear in mind. So to set the context for this video, what are some of the things you'll stress as we move into the rest of this tutorial? Um, I think the difference with, with the, the main difference with the hand drill is that the, the bow drill, uh, the bow itself gives you a huge mechanical advantage. Uh, and it means that you've got a wider range of materials and it's, it's more forgiving if you like. You can, you can kind of force your way through bow drill to a certain degree. Hand drill, there is a more limited range of materials available, especially in certain parts of the UK uh, and your technique and your materials have got to be spot on. So everything's got to be right. And whereas with the bow drill, uh, we can, these days, we can pretty easily just go out with a knife and a saw and grab a few bits and, and make a set and bash it together. It's not so easy with, with the hand drill. Um, I've got the ability to go out here in these woodlands that I know very well and um, get the two bits that I need and probably get it to work. Um, but that's come from years and years and thousands of practice with sort of pre-made sets. So what we're going to do is, is talk you through how, uh, in an ideal world for a hand drill set, you will be gathering materials in advance and giving them a chance to sort of form and season. Because um, would I be right in saying, uh, touching on two quick side notes here, in relation to kind of hand drill and the, the kind of practicalities around doing it, mm. okay, is number one, when we look at... Uh, videos, for example, the tribes out in Africa and, and certain other parts of the world, what we're looking at essentially is kits that they've pre-made, basically. Yeah, um, quite often. I mean, what I was told is that the hunter-gatherer tribes um, who are still using hand drill or still using it from time to time, uh, when they go out on their treks and, and their hunts and so forth, they're taking with them pre-made baseboards and spindles and hand drills that they know are going to work and they've had a chance to sort of practice and get used to. So nobody really wants to be in a situation where they are forced to sort of just try and find two sticks to rub together to sort of to stay alive. And uh, it's been done for various TV survival shows albeit with some editing um, but so uh, the, re the reality is the, the the more you can build up your skills and practice with um, with equipment and sets that you've kind of made over time the better you'll be when you do come to sort of try to make them from scratch and the second thing I wanted to briefly touch on is obviously the practicalities of somewhere like the UK there's kind of temporal climate northern Europe uh, parts of the US Canada etc where typically especially the UK it's very damp, it's a very damp, wet climate. Absolutely. You know? So that, I guess, would make an impact as well in terms of making the kit and obviously then... Yeah, absolutely. We do have materials here in the UK that will work um, that will work very well and we'll go through them today. But I mean, it's uh, th this environment is not sort of 
ideally suited um, to, immediate, to, to instant hand drill. Um, the, the areas of the world where it's sort of originated do tend to be the sort of like the much sort of warmer climates where you do seem to get a wider range of materials that give you the ability to just kind of break them off and, and, and crack on with it. But we can make it work here in the UK. Sometimes it just requires a little bit more prep work. So the goal with this video is to offer a practical guide to, to hand draw based on Craig's experience. You know, there's a lot of things that look great on TV, um, but what we want to do here is really be raw in terms of the real way in which you can go about hand draw and end up with a successful ember and a successful practice. So we'll crack on with this tutorial now with your kind permission, Craig. Sure. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at a brief overview of the hand drill itself, just in case some of you may not be familiar with what it actually is, and then we'll proceed with the rest of this tutorial. Okay guys, so welcome to the hand drill. We're just going to do a quick overview on, uh, on what's involved. Uh, it's often regarded as a very, very pure skill. Um, from, a, from a child, I was always told that you could rub two sticks together to make a fire. And then when I joined the Cubs and the Scouts, there was, uh, as a child, it was the joke about rubbing two Boy Scouts' legs together to start a fire. But it is a very, 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 very pure sort of skill. So the whole idea is utilizing friction. Um, we, are, we have a, a, a drill or a spindle and using hand power alone, it is spun into a socket in a hearth or a baseboard. The friction involved creates heat and the dust that it creates, the friction heats that dust up to the point where it creates an ember, which we can then transfer to a bundle of uh, dry straw, dry grass and so forth, and add oxygen to turn it into fire. So two sticks, rubbing them together to hopefully create a fire. That is the basics of hand drill. So, uh, when it comes to the hand drill, the big difference is we only have two components. We just have the baseboard and the hearth. So we're going to have a quick look at the hearth board first. And the good news is, if you are familiar with bow drill within the UK, um, then a lot of the woods that you use for your baseboard or your hearth will also work for hand drill, which is great news. For example, we, uh, we know that, uh, that lime wood is, or basswood as it's called in other parts of the world, is a superb baseboard for the bow drill. It will also work very, very well for the hand drill. As will some of the other softer woods that are popular, including sycamore, uh, willow. Uh, this is poplar, or sometimes called cottonwood. Cedar. And even, if you can find some good stuff, ivy makes a very, very, very good baseboard as well. These will all work um, for hand drill as the baseboard. You'll probably notice that these are all on the softer end of the wood spectrum for very, very good reason. You know, you've got hand power alone here, so the harder woods, whilst potentially possible, are going to be a lot harder for you to try and drill into. One of the most popular baseboards in the UK, though, is that I want to introduce you to is uh, this stuff is clematis. Technically a weed. And the difference being in here, we are going to take you out into the woods to show you some of this. And this is basically can make us in various different sort of widths that we found. It's not often you'll find this dead standing, good to go, ready to use within the UK. If it's dead, it's probably rotten and too far gone. So quite often the way to get the best out of clematis is to actually find it, cut it, harvest it, allow it to dry out over a period of time so it is perfect to use down the line. But we are going to take you out into the woods, show you what it looks like, how you'd find it, bring some back and show you how we'd process it into a usable board. Hey guys, so we've taken you up to like the top corner of the woodland up near one of the fence lines uh, because this is where I've harvested some clematis before and this is often what you'll find. It comes up out of the ground in a big root works its way up and it just wraps itself around the tree and grows up and up and goes everywhere. It's quite a monster. So it's regarded as a pest by many, many people. Um, but for our purposes, it makes a fantastic baseboard. So what we'd look to do is cut a section out like that, for example, the thicker bits where we could then take it back, allow it to dry out naturally over a period of time. Uh, and then using either power tools, band saws, or obviously, you know, axes and knives, we can process this down into very, very useful baseboards. The great other thing about clematis as well is all this outer bark which we can peel off. This stuff burns fantastically and if you collect a nice big bundle and rough it up it makes a great tinder bundle that will actually light off an ember as well. So a bit of a one-stop shop. 
You don't often find it good to go in situ though. It's often got a lot of moisture in it. If it's dead, it's probably a bit on the rotten side and past its best. So quite often it is a case of cutting it, processing it and allowing it to dry naturally over a period of time for use at a later date. Okay, so we're back at camp and this is the section of clematis that we cut from up in the woods and we're gonna process this down into a usable board. The sort of dimensions that we're gonna go for are very, very similar to this. So as you can see, it's a fair bit thinner than our bow drill base boards. Our bow drill base boards were sort of thumb thick. These are probably, what do we reckon? 10 to 15 mil, something like that. So looking at this, I think we can probably cut this in half. So let's, uh, let's safely cut this in half. We're not gonna need that. Let's just uh, make sure that's nice and safe. Now this stuff's quite sort of soft, so as I say, we can do a lot of this with the knife rather than the ax. And as I mentioned before, if we take a lot of this anti this bark off, a lot of this stuff can actually be used as tinder. So worth kind of collecting this. Okay. So we're going to flatten down one side. So it'll sit nice and flat on the floor and then take this down to about the required dimension. Okay, let's. Now, because this isn't a well-seasoned board, this is literally something we cut 10 minutes ago, even though it's dead, we might actually let this be slightly thicker than usual so that we can really drill into it and create some heat. That area there is not looking too bad, so we'll trim the sides down as well. Try it on the ground, see what we think. So we're gonna be putting a foot around there and we're gonna be drilling this sort of area. around there. Yep, let's just flatten this down a little bit so it sits nice and even. And that's probably worth a go. Okay, so now that our baseboard is ready, we're gonna have a look at the drills or the spindles. Now, there are a number of materials, plants that in, in the UK that will work as successful um, hand drill spindles. Depending where you are in the UK is depending on how easy they are to get hold of. So some of the materials that will work, I don't actually have to hand here in this woodland, um, but for example, there are plants that such as burdock, uh, such as cattail, such as buddleia, such as mugwort, that will work as hand drill spittles. I don't have them here to hand to be able to show you, I'm afraid. What I do have, and what grows in abundance around here, uh, is elder, which is by far our most popular and probably the most common one for hand drill in the UK. Uh, we also have here, what else do we have here? Now this is, uh, this is a hybrid, so this is hazel, but it's got a little elder plug on the end. So if you haven't got a full length straight piece of elder, it is possible to sort of graft a little bit of elder onto another shaft. That being said, it is also possible to use hazel on its own. We also have here some willow. 
And these ones, which are strapped together to keep nice and straight, these are teasel. So this just gives you an idea of some of the materials that are available in the UK. You'll notice the main difference with these compared to, um, to, to bow drill, of course, is that the, uh, the spindles or the drills can be a lot longer. The longer, the better. And they're also a lot thinner, whereas the, uh, the spindles for bow drill were probably around thumb thickness. These are sort of felt tip pen. What's that? Probably about 10 millimeters. We'll go into some of the, the, uh, the qualities of the wood uh, momentarily. But this just gives you an idea of some of the materials that are around. And you can back these up as well. You can kind of combine them. So for example, with the Elder, we can actually you know, put a little plug of a soft material such as Willow actually inside there to boost that up as well. That will work as quite a good hybrid. So are we going to head into the woodland now? To... Yeah, absolutely. So we're going to head into the woodland. I'm going to take you to an area where I know that we have got some materials growing. There should be some hazel uh, that's nice and thin and straight and suitable. Uh, there is an elder tree and there should be some clematis growing. Just so you can see what it looks like in situ and maybe some of the features and the qualities that you should look out for if you're trying to harvest materials. So this is uh, a, a bit of an elder set up here and uh, a lot of this, as you can see, is completely dead and past its best. It just snaps off. So this is too far gone for us to be able to utilise. However, we've got this, uh, this, this green a bit here, which I just want to use this as an example. So what we're looking for are these like the sun shoots. You can see off the branches here where you get these bits that shoot straight up and that's where you get these lovely straight shoots that are perfect for hand drill. And the trick is to try and get them before they turn too rotten like these. But what I want to show you on this one, while this would be a good one, is it's got a really nice thick bark ring and it's that bark ring that we're really interested in. Uh, a lot of people think we use elder because of the pith and the pith doesn't really have any much use to us. What it has got is say, it's this nice thick bark ring which would actually make it good. Now this is too green to work on the spot, but straight to pieces like this that were cut and allowed to dry out over a period of time are good to go. So also up in this area of the wood, we've got uh, lots of our good old friend, the hazel. Lots and lots of coppice bits growing. And what I've spotted on, on here is this section here. Uh, it's definitely on the dead side. There's no life or everything in that. We've got quite a long, quite a straight section here. So it's not impossible. I'm going to cut it. So harvest that about there. Pull that down to safety out of the way. Definitely dead. There we go. So that, it's not impossible that we could actually turn that into a hand drill spindle that's good to go. Wouldn't be my first choice of materials, the hazel, but with practice you can get this to work. Hey guys, so also up around here we have got this uh, semi sort of fallen dead willow and uh, you can see these kind of sun shoots that we've got coming out of it up here which are also dead but I'm thinking it's going to be worth if I take this one here gently and then looking at there I think there is quite a nice dimensioned straight dry bit there that might be worth a try as a hand drill spindle so we'll uh, we'll take this off here There we go, and we'll take that with us as well. Yeah, definitely worth a go. Right, so we've got the uh, three drill spindles that we've kind of collected today. So we have got, in no particular order, we have got an elder, a willow, and a hazel spindle. And what we're gonna do is prep these up to get them ready. Now, hunter-gatherer tribes, who were making sets to take with them on their adventures, they would look uh, at a, 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 a drill like this or like that, and they would actually want them to get them as straight as possible. So they would actually utilize their existing campfire and actually heat um, the spindle up so they could then, when it was hot, they could manipulate it, take the bends out of it and get it as straight and true as possible. 
and it's definitely something worth doing if you're collecting spindles and making them for long-term sets that you are going to use in the future. Heat it up over the embers on the fire and actually manipulate it to get any of the bends out. As far as the bark goes, it is possible to actually leave the bark on. In fact, uh, leaving the bark on on certain ones, like the elder, can actually make them smoother and actually aid in your grip. However, if you need to dry the spindle out more, removing the bark will help. What we also need to do is to remove any sort of rough or high spots that could rip your hands up. So for example, on this hazel one here, there's a little lump there and a little lump there. These are little bits and bobs that could uh, easily increase our chances of getting blisters, which wouldn't be fun. So we can quite simply take the knife and just smooth these down. There we go. I've heard tale as well, again, of you know, authentic hunter-gatherer tribes, of how they'd use things like handfuls of sand and bits of gravel, and they'd kind of wrap it, put it in their hands and wrap it round to sort of try and smooth it down to remove any rough spots. Great, great idea, but of course, in this country, we have the benefit of sandpaper. <laughs> So again, if you're making sort of sets long-term, there's no reason why you can't take your sandpaper, smooth it down, just to remove any rough spots that can rip your hands up and cause, or hot spots and cause blisters. And there we go. And this is the same here with the elder. By all means, trim it down with a knife, but we're just smoothing it down, just to remove any little high spots. Let's have a look at the willow as well. Willow doesn't feel too bad at all. There we go, that doesn't feel too bad at all. Now, as far as prepping the end goes, it's very, very similar to how you'd set up the bottom end, the maximum friction end of a bow drill set. We just want to create what looks a bit like the tip of a drill like that. So it's got a slight peak on it. So if we take this piece of elder, and again, remember we said about the thick bark ring. All we're gonna do, chip away. Don't need too much of a spike on it. Okay, that's probably enough. It just gives it a little bit of a peak so it sort of runs true in one place. And we'll do the same with, let's decide what's going to be top and what's going to be bottom. What are you looking for when you decide that? Um, with this one, I think there's a slight kick at the bottom here. I prefer this end, but there is a slight kick just there. I don't know if you can see that. It just goes off to one side. So actually what I think I'm going to do is just, just take that little bit off, just here. There we go. And then we're looking at it, it looks, it really is quite a nice striped piece, isn't it? You see this end is just a little bit thinner and it looks a little bit punkier. The wood in this end just looks a little bit more solid. So I'm just going to trim this end up. Like that. The hazel is definitely the, uh, the least straight out of, out of this setup. However, I think it's still worth a go. There's definitely a bit of a kick off there. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna use this end and we're gonna give it a little go. It's not perfectly straight, but it's in the right sort of condition. So it is worth a bit of a play with. There we go. 
So there we go. Those three are ready to go. In an ideal world, we could spend time heating these over our existing fire to get them perfectly straight, but then they're, they're not bad at all. I think they're gonna be worth a go for today's purposes. Okay, so we're gonna have a go with this setup. These are materials that we have collected literally half an hour ago from the woods. So this is a, a willow spindle and a, a clematis hearth board. So we've smoothing this down. And what we're gonna do is make uh, an initial divot or dent in the woods, in the wood to uh, allow it to sort of spin in. So just using the tip of the knife, nice and steady, just to make a little bit of a socket here. Just like the bow draw, does it make a difference where you make the hole? Yeah, I mean, you don't want it too close to the edge again so that it can drop off. We, I mean, with this particular piece, and you'll also notice that Clematis cuts quite easily, we're going roughly centre. If it was a much wider board, you'd probably want it. You want it so you got probably five to 10 mil away from the edge. So we don't know how well this will work, but we are gonna give it a go. Pressure is on. Let's have a little feel. Okay, so a couple of things that before we're going to even start doing this. We've got to think about our body position. Now, there are various ways of doing this. A kind of a classic purist way of doing this is to actually sit cross-legged with your feet like this. If you are comfortable with this and you can do this well, absolutely go for it. Some people struggle to generate the power because maybe they've got lower back issues or so forth. So that isn't always the comfiest way for everybody. Some people prefer being up here on their knees and they find like in this sort of position, they can actually pull down and generate more downforce. Um, I've even seen some people kind of in a kneeling position with the foot like this and they find that easier. The reality is try all three, see what suits you, see what works for you. Is it important in all those three to secure the baseboard so it doesn't move? Absolutely, it's a really good idea to stop this to sort of flinging around. Um, I've, seen, um, I've seen videos of, of people and, and even sort of hunter-gatherer tribes who've actually knocked little pegs into the soft earth either side of it to sort of pin it and hold it in place to stop it moving. So yeah, absolutely. The last thing you want is for this to sort of fling around. The reality is being above it like this, it will actually hold it pretty well in place. But we're, we're gonna have a bit of a, we don't know how well this is gonna work. We're gonna have a bit of a play around with it, try some different positions, different techniques. We're gonna talk you through things as we go and see how we get on. Now, as far as the hands go, um, the more you do this, the tougher the skin in your hands get and eventually you do build up a resilience to it. But a lot of people in the early days uh, are very, very, very prone to developing blisters. We're gonna try and avoid that. There is a couple of things that you can do, other than obviously taking all the rough spots out of the, uh, the spindle, which we've already done. There are a couple of kind of natural things that you can do. So what we've got here, because um, we've got a lot of spruce trees in this area, and uh, as, you, as you know, they produce a resin, you get this really kind of waxy, sticky resin for it. And what we can do with this, we can apply a bit to our hands and it'll do one of two things. A, it will put a little bit of a protective coating on them to help stop the blisters. Secondly, what it does is it, gives it, it makes our hands tacky so that when we're doing this, we're pushing down, our hands will stick a little bit and not slide down as quickly, meaning that we can hopefully increase our downforce. Now, it's not the nicest stuff in the world. It is pretty sticky and horrible. And all we're doing is literally putting some of it on there, making these hands sticky like that. There we go. Um, we can also slightly dampen our hands just with a little bit of water. I have seen people spit into their hands, but it's not the nicest thing in the world. So we'll go with a bowl of water if we need it. That's also there so that if we start developing any hot spots, we can cool our hands down. So we're gonna start with um, from the kneeling position. So, I've made a little dent and all we're going to try and do at first is a bit like exactly like we did with the, um, the bow drill. We're going to try and bed in uh, a socket. So put that forward about there. Now, again, we do not need to go at this like a lunatic from day one. We need to build up a rhythm. So my hands are going to start in this sort of position. Okay. And I'm going to try and use the full width of my hands like this. And I'm just going to get it spinning and I'm just going forwards and backwards like that just to get a rhythm going. At the end of the pass, you'll notice that I slightly tilt my hands up like this. So if I do it in very slow motion, I come like this and a slight tilt. 
and like this and a slight tilt. And as I speed that up, this becomes what we call floating hands. It means that I can spin the drill and apply a bit of pressure downwards without my hands traveling down the spindle. And all we're doing at the moment, we're just getting a feel for it. We're warming ourselves up, we're warming our arms and our hands up, getting comfortable, and we're getting some heat into the set. I'm just trying to sort of see how it feels and how we get on. So I'm just applying a bit of downward pressure. And then what I'm gonna do is just allow my hands to travel down the spindle and apply some downward pressure. And I'm gonna try and travel as far down the spindle as I go so that the run that I do lasts as long as possible. Like that, there we go. A little bit of smoke coming out. Don't be afraid with this one to stop and have a break. Your arms will wear out very, very quickly. And it gives us a chance to have a look. So, end of the drill. Getting a little bit dark, getting a nice sort of charred color. Not as pure black as ideally that we'd like, but looking good. The socket, again, looking good. It's a nice dark color. It's definitely got a bit of a charred texture so forth to it. So we want to spin this in enough so that we can cut out a notch exactly the same as we did with the bow drill set. So reach for the knife. This clematis cuts very, very, very easily. So you would not need to use a saw on this. Same as before, we're gonna cut out that little kind of one eighth segment to make a little Pac-Man. If you didn't see our earlier bow drill video, we are going to cut out a section like this so that when we drill into it, the dust that we create is gonna drop down into this hole underneath. And as, a, as before, we don't go all the way into the center because otherwise we'll create a bit of a nipple point on the end of the drill, which is kind of wasted friction. So for those that are old enough, it looks like a Pac-Man or it looks like a trivial pursuit wheel with one of the sections taken away. Using our blade into the middle, make a nice line. This is very, very, very soft compared to some of the other woods, so it cuts very easily. Look at that. And then just chip away. Cuts out very, very easily. Look at that, two or three cuts and we're there. That is probably neaten up a bit at the bottom as well, so it's nice and even and it allows good airflow. And hopefully, we're about there. Okay, so we're all set. We've got our uh, we've got a notch cut. We're all bedded in. So now we're ready to try and build up the ember. So again, as before with the uh, uh, the bow drill, we're trying to build up a pile of dust and then set fire to it. So we're going to do a little bit of warming up uh, with our floating hands again. Remember we said about the slight tilt, and we're just going to see how we get on. Got some smoke. Trying to build up some dust. Having a little look. Not quite, not quite. Okay, so we had a little play with the, uh, the set that uh, we, we gathered materials just a short while ago. So uh, um, it was very, very close. It was producing sort of like dark dust, not quite black enough. I think there's possibly still a bit of moisture in that board, but uh, we had a go, it was a bit of a play for fun. So for the purposes of the video, what we're gonna do 
is uh, we're going to do the here's one I prepared earlier in true Blue Peter fashion. So the same basis we've got here a uh, clematis hearthboard and this time we've got an elder spindle. Um, both of these have obviously had a lot more time to sort of dry out so they, they should work a lot better. So just before we move on to that in terms of the viewers watching at home and including myself as a general protocol especially those in places like here in the UK the northern US etc would we collect the pieces and then let it dry out? Yeah, think? ideally. I mean, if it's a really hot day, I mean, I, I've had um, elder um, spindles, for example, where I've cut them and it's been uh, where the car's been sat in the sun. I've actually put them on the dashboard um, in the window and then by the end of the day with the sun on all day, they've actually dried out enough to work. So it doesn't always take much, um, but cutting that sort of fresh from the uh, quite a dark area of the woods and then expecting it to work straight away was, was asking quite a lot but uh, we might come back to it uh, afterwards and have a, another little play but for now so you can see uh, about techniques and so forth we're going to work with a set that's had a little bit longer to to dry out so its chances of working are a lot higher. So elder drill on this particular example uh, and this is a, a much thinner bit of clematis but again there's enough room on here to create a notch. So we're going to start as usual with our little notch in the middle. Just enough of a divot so that the drill will spin in it freely. So tip of the knife, circle it around, get rid of the mosquito. Definitely get rid of the mosquito. Okay, we'll give that a go. And then the end of the drill, we're just gonna put a slight point on just to help it, it's gotta start spinning. Not too sharp a bit, just so it goes in. Okay. So as before, whichever comfortable uh, position you like, whether it's kneeling, sitting, cross-legged, or even propping it up, but we're just going to get this, try and get this started by spinning it here. And again, I'm using the full width of my hands, front to back, getting comfortable, getting a little bit of pressure on it, warming it, tip up. And then giving it a bit more of a rub. If you notice, as I sort of apply pressure, you will notice that my elbows come in. So I'm actually kind of pulling down. So I go from here, like this, so when I apply more pressure, you can see my elbows actually come in and point downwards. And I'm actually, as I'm spinning, I'm actually pulling downwards. And allow my hands to travel down all the way. Let's get that on a level part of the board. There we go. So we can see it getting darker already. We can see it creating a little bit of dust. It's just a bit springy there, isn't it? Let's try and get it on a bit more level ground. Just a few passes to bed it in. There we go, that's probably enough, yeah. So, nice dark socket, looks nice and charred, nice dark dust, end of the drill, nicely burnt in and charred. So, as in previous times, gonna create the notch. We do this with a knife, it's very, very, very soft wood, this, so a saw is just gonna make a bit of a mess. So we just line it all up. While you're cutting that, um, with the elder, you were mentioning something about the growth ring. The bark ring. The bark yeah, ring absolutely. So uh, when we, uh, as you showed, with the piece that we cut up there, what you're looking for with the elder is a nice thick outer bark ring. The pith has very little to do with actually producing the ember, but a nice thick bark ring is what's going to do the damage. When we first started collecting um, elder for hand drill sets, you know, when we were learning about bark rings and getting more experienced, 
for every, probably for every 30 um, hand drill spindles that we cut and sort of allowed to sort of season, we probably only got about 10, 12 to work. And it was only over time and experience, we kind of learned to sort of spot the ones that had the thicker, better bark rings that would actually work. So there's some things that will only really come with practice and experience. So again, we cut out our little notch, our little Pac-Man. As you saw on the, uh, the setup for the other one, we don't go into the center. It's really easy to make a nice neat notch in these ones because it's such soft wood, it carves very, very easily. There we go. Like that. Again, put the knife down out of, out of harm's way. Uh, a bit of bark or whatever we want to, uh, to collect the, uh, hopefully collect the dust and the ember on. A little bit of look, we can put a bit of moisture on the hands just to make them a little bit tacky. We've got a little bit of a pine resin on there already. This is, it makes a right mess and it's a real pig to get off. So I'm gonna have fun washing my hands later, but, but we are blister free. So that's always a bonus. Okay, so let's see how we get on with this one. So again, we're just starting to warm it up, spinning it gently, getting it moving, getting a bit of heat into it, getting comfortable, loosening up the shoulders, a little bit of, uh, little bit of float. The beauty of the floating hands as well, of course, is it means that you can actually generate downforce with a much shorter spindle. So if you struggle to sort of find really long straight pieces, you, by developing floating hands, you can work with alternative materials and still create some downforce. Of course, when we run our hands down to the bottom, every time we stop, everything cools down. So by floating our hands at the top, we're keeping the drill moving constantly. So we're warming it up, trying to get some heat into it. And then we're gonna start applying a little bit of pressure. Coming down the spindles, all the way, hopefully to the bottom, if it doesn't jump out. Bit more pressure. Looking quite good. Kicking some dust out. And hopefully we're in. Now you'll notice compared to a bow drill, it pops up and goes red a lot quicker. So it is a much, 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 much finer ember. So we're gonna quickly drop that onto a bit of char cloth. And into flame. You can see that ember popped up bright red within a matter of seconds. With the bow drill, we actually had a good few minutes. So it's a much smaller, it's a very, very intense ember that you get from these materials. So you do need to work a little bit quicker with it. But once you drop it into a nice tinder bundle, they'll pop up really, really, really quickly. Hey guys, so now we've successfully created an ember and made fire from the hand drill set, I wanna show you a couple of other options and things that you can do, especially if you're learning. Uh, one option is to create a set of thumb loops. Now, this is obviously a piece of 550 paracord and I've just tied a couple of overhand loops in the end. Now, historically, of course, this would have been done with things like sinew, rawhide, or even natural fibers. Um, and it was uh, quite common to actually kind of bore or drill a hole um, through the, the drill and put this through like that. What we're gonna do is just create in the center of this, uh, is just create a clove hitch. So I'm just gonna try and get it fairly even. One loop, two loops. Try and create it fairly even. Put it over the end like that, pull it tight. Oh, they're even-ish. See, so that sits there and our thumbs go through. And what this enables us to do is to actually pull down and create a lot more downforce. So we're actually pulling down and we're rubbing. 
The trade-off is you do not get as much rotation. You probably only get about half a turn either way. But for some people, this can be a great learning tool because it means you can really kind of pull down and spin the drill like that, creating a lot more downforce. Let's give that a little go, see how we get on. How's that? Are we in? There we go. Struggling a little bit, but uh, you get the idea. No, I don't think that quite held, but you get the idea. So it's a trade-off because you don't get as much spinning movement, but you can create a lot more downforce. So as a learning tool, something to practice with, you can have a go with the thumb loops. Okay, so one other thing that you can do, because we want to have one, we want one more go uh, with this set that we, that we kind of created in the woods earlier. We know it's not perfect. We know it's probably got a little bit of moisture in it, um, but we literally, you saw us, we collected this maybe an hour ago. So we'd love to see if we can get it to work. So what we're going to do is we're going to work as a team. And this is very, very, very similar to what some of the hunter gatherers actually do, uh, did and, and still do. Um, I was told that the, uh, the sand bushman, would obviously work in, in twos and threes. So uh, I'd like to introduce my, my friend and colleague, Sean, who works with me here at Black Wolf. So what we're going to do is we are going to work as a pair and have another little go with the set. So what's going to happen is we're gonna, I'm going to warm up the set as I do as usual, creating a bit of spin and a little bit of heat. And what's going to happen is when I go to the stage where I'm going to do the passes, where I'm actually kind of pulling down and creating downforce, when I get to the bottom, my hands reach the bottom, Sean is then going to take over from the top the idea being is that we've got, we don't stop, there's a continual uh, effort going on, and I get sort of five to sort of 10 seconds in between to rest as does Sean, and maybe between us, we'll have a little go. It's our last ditch attempt with this one for a bit of fun, but it does show you something that you can practice as part of a team. We all good? Yeah. Right, so let's see if we can create a little bit of heat to get it started. So again, a little bit of float. There we go, a little tiny bit of heat going on there. Okay, so I'm just going to do a slow pass to start with. And then when I get to the bottom, Sean is going to take over. Don't need to go too mad just yet, just get to create some dust. So we're going to keep it nice and steady. Then when Sean gets to the bottom, I'm going to carry on on the top here like this. Try and do a long pass all the way. No, it's breaking the board up. Oh. Ah. <laughs> okay, so that tells us, as you can see here, we've actually snapped a bit of the board off. So that tells us two things. Um, we've probably created the notch too far across to this edge, um, and this board definitely isn't in the best of conditions. So the best thing to do with this board would be probably to saw it off here, trim all this flat, and allow it to sort of dry up and season up over a period of time. So uh, a couple of little hacks that we mentioned earlier that I just wanted to sort of show you in a bit more detail. Uh, we mentioned earlier about kind of like using plugs and things like that. Um, so with the elder, if you can't find the perfect piece of elder that's sort of long enough, or if you've got an existing elder spindle that's worn right down, what you can do is kind of cut the end off so that this bit here is uh, still good. It's got a nice thick bark ring and so forth. And you can attach it onto the end of another spindle. So for example, here I've got a piece of hazel and we've whittled a bit of a spike down. And then using some natural glue, like some pine resin or something like that, you can actually wedge that spindle onto the end of that, and then you've got a usable hand drill. Oh, excellent. So that's if the elder, the actual main part of it is not, is not good anymore. Right? Yeah, so if you haven't got like a, a good, because it, it is quite common to get really nice sort of straight bits of hazel, uh, if you've got a good bit of elder that's not a perfect kind of condition, but it's not, not long enough and you can just utilize the tip of it, you can kind of bond it onto the end of sort of something else, or you know, you can bond this onto the end of a, a willow pea stick or, or something like that. Now that will hold pretty well, but you could kind of reinforce that by using some glue, you know, be it either stuff you've got from a shop or you can use a little bit of heated pine resin if you've got it available to bond that on and uh, make that usable one. 
Uh, another way of possibly improving your elder is we know that willow works really, really well as well. So if you've got a nice straight piece of elder, what you can actually do, because obviously you've got the hollow pith, you can make yourself a little plug out of willow. So that's just a little piece we carved down and cut off. And you can actually put that plug into, there we go, sit like that, into the end of your elder. And that will actually work really well as well. So you've got the, you've got the good bark ring, which we know works well, but you've also got some willow, which we know works good as a, as a, as a friction material. So putting those two together like that, can increase your chances. Oh, excellent. So once again, as with a lot of the principles around hand roll and also bow drill, mm -hmm. would you play around with different combinations? And yeah, ab ab absolutely. It's it's um, uh, my my kind of silly record is doing is using a, a, a short um, hazel drill about that long and floating it into another piece of hazel. Um, that's kind of my uh, fun challenge. But realistically, you're looking for the easy combos that will work. So. Um, uh, elder on clematis, that kind of thing, elder on ivy and, and into lime are, are great ones. So there you have it, my friends. That is a wrap for this video on hand drill friction fire lighting. Craig, thank you so much. Absolute pleasure. So to surmise in, a couple of things I want to briefly discuss. So number one, an overview of kind of what we did and how it kind of all went. Um, so obviously we gave an overview over the handle itself, yeah. what it's about. We looked at the components. Mm -hmm. uh, we then went out and foraged those two components. We yep. brought them back and processed them. And then obviously we went through like three different styles of doing the hand drill itself, mm -hmm. okay? So um, what I'd be right in saying is that normally the pieces that you forage, you'd normally let them dry a little bit. Ideally, yeah. I mean, the, um, I mean, when I do sort of shows and demos, obviously I've got sets that are very, very well seasoned. But if I was kind of foraging for materials, um, like that, then it's 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 hard to get sort of like just be able to grab handle materials on the spot and get them yeah. to work sort of straight away. So uh, usually I'd be kind of collecting materials on one day to use, you know, another day or down the line. So is that what you'd encourage those watching now to kind of do generally as a general rule of thumb? Would you? Yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, I mean, if you happen to find what you believe to be the perfect materials, absolutely. But one of the things you can really do is you know get your sets to a stage where you know they're going to work and then work on your body positioning and your hand conditioning. Hand conditioning is a really, really, really big factor. You know, um, the secret to sort of not ripping your hands to pieces is to do little and often. So kind of, you know, work your hands for a little bit, stop, give them a chance to sort of breathe. You know, don't allow big hot spots to build up on your hands because, you know, I've seen people rip blisters uh, the size, you know, of their palms. Uh, and you can end up doing permanent damage. So if you get a hot spot on your hands, stop, come back to it another day. So on, on the topic of conditioning, it's actually another question I had for you. So let's say obviously when you're not doing the hand roll itself, but you want to work for let's say five minutes a day, 10 minutes a day or whatever yeah. in between that, and you want to kind of work on conditioning your you hands. You want me to tell my secret conditioning, don't you? He's got a secret <laughs> conditioning Well, actually, I, I have mentioned it online before, so it's not actually uh, that much of a secret, but um, in the build up to when I started doing a lot of demos at shows and events, starting with things like the Bushcraft Show would have been probably about, what, six years ago? Um, over that sort of three day period, we, we reckon I probably be just chatting to my friend Sean, we probably reckon I did 30, 40, 50 hand drill demos, you know, 20, 30 a, a day. Uh, and the way that I kind of stopped my hands from getting absolutely ripped to pieces is, um, are you familiar with the, uh, the, the freeze pops, you know, the, the kids kind of ice poles? Yes. Um, now I'm a big fan of these. I know they're very bad for you. They're just full <laughs> of sugar and all sorts of nasty things, but I, but I love them. And what I did is so I'd have it each one, I'd, each night I'd get one out of the freezer and I'd sit there with it on my lap and I'd do this kind of floating hands action with it, with the ice pole and I'd work it up and down until I'd literally defrosted it into a liquid and then, wow. I'd, and then I'd drink it or, you know, or, sort of, or, or have it. And over a period of time it did various things. It helped me build up the muscle memory in my forearms and my wrists. And I think working the cold into my hands sort of like literally, I do it every night. Um, I think it just toughened up the skin on my hands to the, to the stage where I was no longer getting blisters uh, and I could crack them out a lot easier. So, uh, yeah. so, so an alternative to um, a technique where you get diabetes <laughs> after two months, 
could you just use just a piece of wood? Yeah, absolutely, and, and block, absolutely. Yeah, it really, you, you could just sit there and kind of work and you build up these kind of forearm um, tendons and these muscles here and you develop the sort of thicker skin on your hands. So uh, yeah, I mean, realistically, you could get a hand drill set and just do a little bit and often. It was just because it was, I was sat at home on the sofa watching the telly, minding my own business, and I could sort of do that without sort of, you know, interfering. There, there's going to be a correlation anybody. between hand drill people and uh, a, a rise in type 2 diabetes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if they do low sugar versions, but uh, but you know, I, I remembered you know lot martial artists you know like you know the Shaolin monks and so forth you know used to sort of work with ice by punching and conditioning to toughen their hands. Yeah. So it was sort of in the back of my mind I was sort of thinking you know this is conditioning the skin the the, the cold and the ice is helping. Um, another um, quick question for you in relation to the spindle. Mm. We spoke off camera and I don't think we covered it is. Going into a DIY store to buy um, woods, woods that are not conventional in terms of that you've actually found. Ah, well, let me just grab one because I've got one just over here for you. Let me just jump off camera for a second. So in your local garden centre, um, large DIY store, you will often find this sort of stack of these. And these are these willow pea sticks. And you buy them in a bunch and you can make frames for growing your know, running beans and things off plants mm -hmm. up. Um, so I bought some of these for fun uh, a few years ago, wondering, because it's got the right sort of dimensions, it's nice and straight, it's the right sort of thickness. And I thought, well, Willow's great for bow drill, can mm -hmm. I hand drill with it? And after a bit of persistence and practice, I found that uh, if I was drilling this into clematis or lime or willow, something, I could actually create a hand drill ember with it. So oh, uh, wow. if you are struggling for materials in your area, and you want to practice, and especially things like your hand conditioning, you can pop along to your local DIY store and uh, buy yourself some willow pea sticks. Excellent, now that's a great tip there. Um, so are there any last um, questions that come up in terms of troubleshooting that we haven't covered that people may message you or bring about in forums and say, I'm struggling with this, I'm struggling with that. Um, is there anything that came up? A lot of it is people saying about what materials they can get in their areas. You know, you'll see a lot of people posting on hand drill uh, and talking about elder into clematis, and you'll get a lot of people saying, I haven't got elder in my area, or I've bought elder and I can't, oh, I've, I've, I've obtained elder from my local woodlands, but I can't get it to work. And as I mentioned on the video, you need to look for that really nice sort of thick bark ring. Uh, with things like clematis, yeah, it's brilliant if you've got it in your area. If you haven't, uh, there are other materials available. You know, you've seen us today talk about using uh, willow or lime or ivy. Um, so hopefully there are there is some sort of material um, in your area that, uh, that, you, that you can utilise. Um, other troubleshooting things, I get people obviously talking about the hands, which we've now covered. How do you stop ripping your hands to pieces? How do you build up your, your, your arms? Um, and say practicing with things at home, uh, as my friend Sean mentioned earlier, something you can practice with at home is a drumstick. Uh, buy, oh, one from your buy one from your local, it's, it's a little bit shorter, yeah. but you can sit there at home with a drumstick on your lap and you can kind of get that, yeah. you can get that kind of floating hands action sort of like going just to build up the muscle memory. Uh, I do get a lot of people who say I'm getting smoke or I'm getting brown dust, but it's just not holding an ember. And a lot of that, if, you know, if your materials are up to scratch, they are good enough quality, um, then the biggest problem is you're not creating enough downforce. What, something we tried to focus on on the video earlier was we were saying about how I was, when I was spinning like this, my elbows were up. But then when I was trying to sort of create the heat, I was really pulling my elbows down and you're pulling down into the board. So, you know, get, get in a position where you're comfortable, whether you're standing or kneeling or whatever, and then pull your elbows in and pull them down towards the ground and lean into it so you can really generate that downforce. Um, don't be afraid to sort of practice with a friend doing the kind of uh, working as a pair. Have a go with the thumb loops. Uh, and really, I mean, my, my success with hand drill has come from just repetition and practice. But you have literally done it thousands of times. Haven't you? Literally thousands of times. And it still goes wrong uh, yeah. from time to time. It, it's, uh, it's a very, very nerve wracking one to do in front of a live audience. Um, you know, when you've, I, uh, I remember doing it at the Bushcraft show probably about three years ago and uh, I had a bit of a crowd gathered watching and I looked up and I had Ray Mears watching me. Um, so, and, wow. and in, and in pre no, no, no pressure. No pressure. And in, pre <laughs> in previous years as well, I've been doing hand drill demos and had Lofty Wiseman sort of sitting there looking at me and pulling faces and making jokes as, as he does, bless him. Um, so it's always nerve wracking doing it because it can still go wrong and does still go wrong. It's never a guaranteed one. Um, Somebody said, it's, it's a corny quote, but it's very true. Somebody said to me at, the, at one of the shows a couple of years ago, 
you're so lucky to be able to do that without ripping your hands to shreds. Mm. And my response was, the more I practice, the luckier I get. That's a great point to leave it on. No, I appreciate everything. I think the rest of it, and in terms of what I've taken away, because this is very new to me as well, as well as seeing kind of like the whole tutorial, as well as kind of doing it after this video, is to obviously experiment around with different woods. Absolutely. To make sure they're dried out properly, to make sure there's a lot of conditioning going on day to day, um, and to kind of just, just that repetition, you know, just to kind yeah, of- Yeah, little and often, to, to build up your, your hands and your, and your arms and so you don't get fed up and frustrated with it and just, just you know, try a little bit, experiment uh, and just put the hours in. Excellent. So on that note, guys, that is a wrap for this video. As I mentioned at the very beginning, this is part two of a two-part series. In part one was a very detailed look at the bow drill side of things. So if you haven't seen that video, I'll put a link below, do go check that out. And obviously this is part two of the friction fire lighting series covering hand drill in as much detail as possible. Also a reminder, down below there is a timestamp to all the relevant sections. So the idea is, as the encouragement from Craig is, is that you go out and try this, whether you're an absolute beginner like me, or an intermediate or even advanced. You go out, you give it a go, and if there's certain areas and, and kind of like uh, uh, sections of the hand roll process that you're struggling with or need a bit more kind of reminder of, then obviously you can skip to that particular section using that timestamp down below. Also what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna put a link below to Craig's website. You can find out a lot more about all the myriad of training courses that he runs in his beautiful woodland in the southeast of England. And he also runs expeditions abroad as well. And in terms of the fire lighting, he does a lot of one-on-one -on -one training as well as group training. So you can find out about that as well as the other courses that he runs. Also as a final request from me, is something like what you watched in this video, a hand draw, as, and also the bow draw in the video prior. Um, Craig actually teaches this for a living, he charges for this. And in his very kind permission, he's kind of allowed me to come down and spend a, an entire day with him that he would normally spend teaching people. Um, and he's also allowed me to kind of share this kind of video, document it and allow it to share it to you guys so that you may gain benefit and help you on your journey to kind of on this friction fire lighting kind of process. So all I would ask from you, if you gain any value from this whatsoever, it will mean the world to me as kind of our way of saying thank you to Craig is kind of check out the links below to his Facebook and his Instagram and give him a follow on either one or even both. And it's just kind of our way of saying thank you to kind of Craig for allowing me to come down and document this entire process. And once again, I'm very grateful that you allowed me to do that. Oh, you're very welcome, uh, um, my friend. It's always great you know, spending time with Craig. I learned so much, you know, even kind of filming this. So really hope you enjoyed this video. One thing we mentioned in the bow drill video, I'm not sure if we mentioned on this video, is the actual kind of tinder bundle, kind of fire building kind of side of things. Uh, I'll be getting a lot of questions in terms of PMs on social media regarding that. A lot of people that are struggling in different aspects of it. And in bow drill, we talked about it a bit more in terms of the actual tinder bundle, how you build one and how you actually build out a proper fire once you've got the ember going. So what Craig mentioned was that there's a possibility that I can come back and see him if it's a video you guys want to see. Absolutely. So, similar to the hand drill and bow drill, we'll dive deep, spend an entire day with Craig filming, and we dive deep into every single aspect and facet of the fire building process. So if you fancy that kind of video and you think that will benefit you, let me know in the comments below. It'll be awesome if we get a good feedback and obviously with Craig's kind permission, we'll block a day out, I'll come back to see him here in the southeast of England and we'll document that video for you guys to watch and help you in this fire lighting journey. So before we kind of depart, are there any final words from your good self? Uh, no, just, uh, you know, it's been an absolute pleasure having you today and, and seeing you again. Uh, and for people out there, as um, you know, drop us a comment. Um, I, I, I speak to lots of people who do hand drill regularly. We're quite a, a small, tight grip group, the ones who do it regularly, and we're always sharing tips and tricks with each other. So uh, please share your own experiences. We'd love to sort of yeah. see how you're getting on with your journey. And actually, that was a good reminder. Two quick small things I forgot before we completely wrap up. My outros are always very long, right? I've got a lot to cover, people, right? So two quick things. Number one, if you give this a go in any shape or form, please tag us. It will be great yeah, to, kind absolutely. Of, to kind of see kind of where you're at with this. The idea is, is to inspire you to give it a go or to improve upon your existing skill. So if you post it anywhere on social media, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, etc., please tag us, obviously using the links below and obviously myself, Zed Outdoors. Um, tag us, let us know how you get annoyed. It's always awesome seeing mm. people tagging on. I see tags on a daily basis from previous tutorials that I've done. 
people have done X, Y, and Z using those tutorials. So it'll be awesome. So for you to tag us, let us know kind of, you know, obviously what, what it is you've done, the progress that you had. And also um, the other thing on top of that as well is um, in terms of the, um, the kind of videos that we're gonna come moving forward, also do let us know as well, okay? Like kind of what you wanna see. If there's other things that you're struggling with in terms of the fire lighting, do let us know and obviously we can cover that as well. So once again, Craig, a sincere thank you uh, once again. Oh, Happy pleasure. It's been, it's been a fun day, my well, friend. Thing. Uh, he's been an absolute trooper. We've had a mammoth day of filming today. We started really early. Um, and obviously it's quite late now, so it's literally about 10, 11 hours of filming. So what time yeah, is it now? Yeah, it's quarter past seven. That's it. Uh, you got here about eight o'clock this morning. That's right. So yeah, it's been a long, but a fun day. It's been an awesome day. But so I think it's, I think it's definitely beer o'clock. <laughs> so once again, guys, I really do appreciate you watching. A sincere thank you to Craig once Anytime. again. And to Sean behind the camera to kind of assist in and helping us out throughout all of today. So as I mentioned, guys, all the links down below, go and check that out. I hope you enjoyed this video. And like I said, you know, look forward to kind of seeing Craig on future videos where we're covering other things and diving deep. So that is a wrap for this video. Finally. 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 I've ended the outro. The famous <laughs> Z Outdoors long outros. I have a lot to cover, man. That's what it is. So there you go, guys. Hope you enjoyed this video. And as always, I hope whatever you're doing, you have a blessed day, a blessed week ahead. From myself, Z Outdoors and Craig Fordham, peace out.